this is one of those moments when you can feel history moving around us. Hi, I'm Ian Bremmer, and welcome to the G Zero World Podcast, an audio version of what you can find on public television where I analyze global topics, sit down with big guests, and make use of small puppets. This week, I sit down with U.S. Senator Chris Coons, a Democrat from Delaware who serves on the Senate Foreign Relations Committee. He's traveled throughout Asia and the South Pacific, meeting with America's old allies and assuring them that Washington hasn't lost its way. He's also been a leading voice on the Russia investigation. Let's get to it. The G Zero World is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. Senator Chris Coons from Delaware, great to be with you, Chris. Thanks, Ian. Great to be on with you. So uh, let me start with global trade. And, you know, we, we have this environment where the U.S. and China uh, are trading uh, spars. You've been uh, pretty concerned about what the Chinese are doing internationally. How on track do you think Trump is with his criticisms right now? Uh, he may be on target, but he's certainly not on track. Um, so... I've publicly commended President Trump for making a very high priority of his foreign policy, challenging China's mercantilist policies, the ways in which they uh, compel technology transfer or simply steal intellectual property or um, limit access uh, to the Chinese market. But um, the ways in which President Trump has chosen uh, to challenge the Chinese with a tariff war um, started off badly and have gotten worse. Um, by slapping national security justified tariffs on close allies like Canada. Canada or Sweden or South Africa or Germany. You do just not to pick four countries who've complained Canada about Canada a national security threat? Is that Canada what you're is me? not a national security threat. And they don't think they're a national security threat. In fact, they oddly think they've been our closest, most reliable ally right behind the Brits in virtually every conflict we've ever been a part of. So um, I think when walking into a conflict, you don't start by smacking your best friends and then head in. Um, that was a big misstep, and I think um, President Trump would be well advised to take a step back and say, we're going to focus on China and their practices, and we're not going to focus on harming our European allies, our Asian allies, our Western Hemisphere allies. U.S. and Europe, at least for the time being, uh, the guns seem to be holstered. Briefly, yes. The Americans and the Japanese are now actively talking about new trade arrangements. Um, do you think, I mean, Admittedly, the first thing Trump did was get out of TPP and then started hitting allies. But if right. you look at this just right now, would you say that the U.S. is in a better position to start now working on the China issue or not really? Yes. I'll, I'll say those recent developments yeah. ha have actually pulled us out of what I thought was a very bad place. So you feel more comfortable? I feel less uncomfortable. Okay. What um, do you and think I do we think there is an opening here now. What should we be doing with China now? How should we be effectively pressing them given mm -hmm. the challenges that you are very seriously concerned about? Um, first, one of the things I worked closely with my Republican colleagues here and the administration on was getting the BUILD Act passed and signed into law. This gives us a new tool in our toolkit, a development finance institution mm -hmm. um, that's double the size of OPIC and capable of doing broader and bigger things than OPIC has been able to do in the last 40 so years. So some response to One Belt, One Road Some response to One Belt, One Road. Some response that if effectively deployed over the next year, allows us to show up in a dozen, two dozen countries and say, we're here, we're engaged, we're, we're gonna channel, we're gonna facilitate um, US private capital into much larger projects than we've been engaging in before. That's an important pushback. Mm -hmm. um, second, we need to be having real So play some offense, basically. Play some offense. Okay. Um, we also need to look at TPP. Um, I think at least six of the potential TPP partners uh, have now ratified the successor agreement. It's going to come into force. Uh, and Without we, the U.S.? Without us. We need to look at what it means for there to be a table that we helped build and shape with an empty chair at the end. Um, and whether there is um, some scenario under which it's in our interest, in our workers' interest, in our economy's interest, uh, but also helps reunite our allies around the Pacific Rim, 
uh, by re-engaging with a, a new TPP. Uh, why is, in terms of the Chinese are obviously doing a lot more. They're, they're now talking about a third um, aircraft carrier as well. Yes. Um, I, I'm more talking about the horn because I know it's something, you know, you, you're raising an alarm yes. that's saying, hey, the Chinese militarily yes. are suddenly flexing. Yes. How do you think the Americans should respond? How are we responding? Um, we should respond by investing in alliances and partnerships yeah. and by strengthening and modernizing uh, weapons platforms and systems to deal with the security situation we're likely to be in. Um, the South China Sea, um, the growing Chinese uh, Blue Water Navy um, are areas where we are likely to face significant threats um, that without modernization, both of our Navy uh, and of a number of our other operational capabilities, we're not really adequately prepared for. Um, we need to present an alternative um, to an approach, one belt, one road, through which the Chinese are gaining access to or control over or almost literally ownership of key strategic deep water ports, you know, from Djibouti to Sri Lanka, to, I mean, really all across the Indo-Pacific. So, so far, what I've heard is a lot of talk about carrots, a lot of talk mm -hmm. about U.S. strategy, to the extent that there needs to be stick in the American, you know, arsenal with the Chinese, what do you think the largest and most effective stick should be? If we have an alternative, values-based, international order, where trade and access to trade requires openness, mm -hmm. um, that's the best alternative, I think. So there are challenges in the WTO that we could be more aggressive at bringing. Um, there are challenges based on values that are important. If we continue to engage in relationships such as has been the case with the Saudis, um, the Khashoggi incident was a pretty critical turning point for us. Um, if we only look at our relationships internationally in terms of transactions and not in terms of values and transactions, then we look more and more like the Chinese in terms of how we interact with the developing world, how we interact with our close allies. I think it's important that we have a values proposition that's different than the Chinese. The Chinese come to heads of state and say, we're not gonna ask difficult questions, non-interference in your domestic affairs. We're not gonna press you about free press, about human rights, about uh, politically open systems. There's a lot of things that are difficult that we're just not gonna raise. And they point to us and say, those guys, however, will interfere in your internal affairs. We have a different view, which is that what we stand for um, has been codified in the UN Universal Declaration of Human Rights and actually is the best path forward towards all countries to be free and fair and open. And that has a, attracted allies to support the United States over 70 years. We have a different view or we had a different view? We have to continue to press the view that has been the dominant view of American foreign policy for seven decades. We're not perfect. We obviously have made missteps and errors at times, but we have to continue to put our values before our narrow economic or security interests I think that is, frankly, the most powerful way we compete with an alternative vision um, that is essentially state authoritarian capitalism. Another place that priorities and values come into play is Ukraine. Mm -hmm. uh, Trump administration, uh, under Trump administration, we actually have defensive weapons systems that have been yes. provided to the Ukrainians. That was not true under the Obama yes. administration. Does that mean that these guys are more focused on values now with the Ukraine or no? Um, I think the guiding principle of President Trump's early foreign policy was whatever Obama did, do the opposite. Mm -hmm. um, I would like to believe um, that there is now a stronger uh, bipartisan consensus around we support Ukraine, we want them to be successful um, in resisting Russian aggression, we want to see the Minsk process resume and work, uh, but uh, in, a, in a region uh, at a time when Putin continues hostile and aggressive actions, um, we, I think, in the United States have a clear role, which is to marshal uh, our allies in imposing and sustaining sanctions against Russia until they stop aggressive action against Ukraine um, and implement the Minsk Accords. Providing um, weapon systems to Ukraine that allow them to successfully defend their territory, I think, is a key part of that. Now, the Americans have taken individual sanctions efforts against the Saudis in response to the Khashoggi case. In yes. the case of Russia so far, most of what's been done also a series of individuals. Are you suggesting that what we need are sectoral sanctions against the Russians? Quite Something possibly. that would really damage the economy? Yes. Yes. And do and, and you think the Europeans would be with us in that regard? Hopefully. How much? I mean, the transatlantic relationship right now, how much of that is on the United States not being a leader and how much of that is on the Europeans not having their act together? 
the thing that I try to encourage folks to do is to look at actions and then look at statements. If you look at actions, um, more and more of our NATO allies are getting to the 2% of GDP expenditure in defense. More and more of our NATO allies are actually making changes in terms of interoperability, um, exercises, information sharing, um, intelligence integration. Uh, we are making significant moves in what I think is a good direction. Um, partly, the clear and present threat uh, from Russia has reanimated NATO. Um, the challenge of migration um, has been a real challenge operationally uh, and from a values perspective to NATO. Uh, but we've also seen changes in the politics of Central and Eastern Europe um, that are putting NATO and the North Atlantic relationship at some risk. Um, I do think that continuing, continuing to not just invest in this relationship, not just exercise this relationship, but to speak in ways that value this relationship uh, are critical to our path forward. The president's wrong about the basic construct of collective security. Mm. Um, it's not that we're the chumps and the EU uh, and NATO uh, were created to benefit the EU and benefit NATO to our disadvantage. Um, we helped establish those organizations, those structures for our security and for our prosperity, and we have benefited from them mightily. We can and should continue to have a conversation about burden sharing, um, but to continue to harangue our allies as if somehow they've taken advantage of us and they all owe us an unpaid bar tab uh, misses the fact that more than a thousand NATO soldiers have died in Afghanistan fighting alongside Americans. The only time Article 5 has been invoked, uh, I think starting the conversation with gratitude um, and uh, continued commitment to collective security and then sharpening the focus on investment is the better way. So to coming back to the transactionalism, not the right way right. to approach key alliances. Right. Uh, do you think that the vote to protect the special counsel mm -hmm. is now as important given how much is out, mm -hmm. how far Mueller has gone uh, without delivering an official report. I mean, have we passed the point of no return on the Manafort, on the Roger Stone, on WikiLeaks, Julian Assange, all of this? What do you right. think? Uh, every time um, there's been another um, charging document or indictment from Mueller, mm -hmm. um, you realize that he had many times more uh, details, information, leads, than any leak or revelation about that particular area of his investigation had previously suggested. My hunch is that when this investigation comes to an end, and there is hopefully some public accounting of everything that's been investigated, it'll prove to be far broader and deeper than um, current evidence would suggest. So I, I actually think it's important, vital even, um, that Mueller be allowed to complete his investigation and that that work product then be shared with the Senate and the House and be public. Um, neither of those are a foregone conclusion at the moment. Um, we no longer have a Senate-confirmed attorney general who's recused himself mm -hmm. and a deputy attorney general, Senate-confirmed supervising. We have an acting attorney general, a partisan who a year ago was saying all sorts of negative things about Mueller. We have a president who continues to criticize and attack and tweet against Mueller. Um, I think it is in everyone's interest, including the president, for Mueller to complete his investigation and then, Why is it in the president's interest for that to occur? Um, as I've said many times on television, Mr. President, if you're innocent, act like it and have confidence that this investigation will clear you. But that is a big presumption, is it not? That is a big presumption. Especially when, I mean, we know that when we have cases that are this expansive, the ability to get someone on an obstruction, to get someone mm -hmm. on a lie after the fact, when they've been back into a corner and Trump trips over his tongue continually, that doesn't sound like it's in his interest to allow the process to continue. Um, if he injects himself and fires Mueller, yeah. having spent months challenging, questioning, harassing, I think that will precipitate uh, a crisis. Um, and I think that will lead to a real challenge to his presidency. I, I think it is in his best interest um, to have the whole process play out and then confront whatever it uncovers rather than to try and cut it short. You understand how he might think differently. Of course. Uh, is it in his interest to uh, not pardon Paul Manafort? Um, it depends from what perspective. Um, I don't know if he's a president who cares about the judgment of history. Uh, if he is, he shouldn't. Um, where do you think this actually goes? <laughs> does this become a constitutional crisis, and what does that mean in your mind? 
Um, what that means is um, a breakdown in um, the rule of law and in the ordered relationships between branches um, so severe uh, that it compels uh, a realignment between branches. Either, as happened in uh, the Nixon tapes case, an appeal to the Supreme Court to reach a decision they hadn't previously considered uh, and to direct an action uh, by the president in order to uh, bring the executive branch back into compliance with basic orders of um, the rule of law, um, or um, some basic challenge uh, to the president's actions as being extra constitutional. Would you be relieved by that? In other words, would it be better in your view to say, let's just get this to where this, there is a crisis, the Supreme Court has to judge too damn partisan in Congress, and they're going to be an independent arm of government? Look, I, um, I think the Supreme Court had a lasting and negative impact on its um, important and powerful um, reputation for being not a partisan political entity, but the ultimate arbiter of the meaning of our Constitution, and thus above narrow temporal partisan concerns. Um, when the Supreme Court ruled on Bush v. Gore by a 5-4 majority and stopped a recount and handed a presidential election to ultimately President Bush, um, I think they put at risk um, the credibility of the court as a nonpartisan institution. Um, I worry um, that uh, with a new conservative majority, and in particular, given Justice Kavanaugh's articulated views on executive power, um, that they may well take action that would be comparably harmful to the long-held perception of the court as being interested in the um, primacy of the Constitution and the constitutional order rather than partisan concern. So in your view, the fabric of the political institutions of this country have been damaged. They're at real risk. They're at real risk. If the president allows Mueller to complete his investigation, if the investigation produces results which the Congress then handles responsibly, if the Supreme Court doesn't um, shut down or prevent uh, Mueller from um, recommending what actions or reporting what actions uh, he might, um, I, I think that goes a long way towards sustaining our current um, constitutional order. So last question, Senator. Yeah. How does it feel to be uh, in your position at such an important point in history? Well, you know, all of us are here by some combination of um, luck, chance, error, providence. Um, it's challenging. Um, I, um, I struggle every day with whether or not I'm doing enough, whether I'm doing a good job, whether I'm representing my constituents well, whether I'm um, doing everything I possibly can to be fair, to be engaged, to be honest, to be disciplined, and to be um, a contributor. Um, but this is one of those moments when you can feel history moving around us. Chris Coons, thank you very much. Thanks, Ian. That's our show this week. We'll be right back here next week, same place, same time, unless you're watching on social media, in which case it's wherever you happen to be. Don't miss it. In the meantime, check us out at g0media.com. The G Zero World is brought to you by our founding sponsor, First Republic. First Republic, a private bank and wealth management company, places clients' needs first by providing responsive, relevant, and customized solutions. Visit firstrepublic.com to learn more. You're listening to the G-Zero World with Ian Bremmer podcast, your weekly geopolitical deep dive into the world's biggest news stories, featuring in-depth conversations with global leaders and newsmakers. To get more of G-Zero's insights on global politics every morning, sign up for our free newsletter, G-Zero Daily, at gzeromedia.com.